Hi, I'm James McGuire, and I'm here today with a really interesting uh, nonprofit. They do important work around uh, grief and trauma recovery, among other uh, topics. Uh, the name of the organization is called Live Like Goose, and I'm here with the two co-founders. With me is Monica Martin, uh, executive director and co-founder. Hello to you, Monica. Hi there. Thanks for having me. And uh, also with me is uh, Tavius Aiden. He's a co-founder and development director. Hello to you, Tavius. Hello, everybody. Hey. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, interesting. I know there's a really personal backstory about why you started the organization. Can you talk about what, what prompted you to start Live Like Ghosts? Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, uh, a few years ago, uh, we lost our only son. Um, he was 16 and in a car accident. And... Um, his nickname was Goose, and so we wanted to do something in his honor, and what we discovered through our own grief recovery process was just how resources were needed and weren't really available, and that we felt we could help provide some resources maybe that aren't out there, or at least that we hadn't found yet um, through our own experience. Me. Yeah, yeah it, it seems like it, it must have been a really difficult time. I mean, it's kind of, it's really neat that you actually took that period, which must have been so full of grief and actually decided to build something positive. That's really, really fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was a really, the whole process of really going kind of inward and really like our own personal background, our own personal development up until that point, unfortunately felt like it had been building to prepare us almost for that in a way of really learning to how to really listen to ourselves and what we needed um, internally first as we can grieve and go through the waves of trauma that grief can be. And when we started actually reaching out for other forms of support for like groups or therapists, what we each found in our own ways was that the way we needed support through it wasn't really met in those types of needs. Um, there, there definitely are tons of resources out there in the field like my background is i am uh, studying in psychology and somatic so i understand that however this aspect that we were moving through we couldn't find the the mentors and the teachers and the like-minded folks at the time and so what we were inspired to do in creating the nonprofit is filling in the gap so we can go and connect with other resources that are already out there and help add to the breath that they're already um, offering. Mm -hmm. Steve, so, so what, do, what, what do you do that maybe is different from some of the other groups or that, that may or may not address that? What's, what, what is unique or, or you know, how, how would you define your approach? Well, we, we, we're working from the inside out. We're creating safe spaces where people can come and, uh, be, and be present and um, hopefully be able to be open and uh, honest and feel uh, capable of connecting with other people. So a lot of what we do is try to create a uh, safe space and presence. And then we try to allow for people's normal process to occur and just support that process. Cause mostly people have things to do and they don't have time to grieve. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is create the time and space for people to be able to grieve, however it is that they're grieving and then support them in that process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, a lot of the field is pieces of it are cognitive focused in, in looking at the memories and looking at the process from a more mental place of being. And so in really allowing the person find their own expression of what that grieving is, like we have people who come in who have a lot of anger and, and they don't feel like it's safe to actually express the anger in other places in other ways. And so we find a healthy way, whether it's doing expressive arts and, uh, or even doing movement. Um, some, one of the other platforms where I bring it into is in, in boxing. And so allowing like the youth that they can have a lot of their own grieving and their own traumas, being able to express it in a healthy way that they're not being judged. They're not being shamed. They don't have to rationalize or create a story of why it's happening. They can just be in that pure expression. And what I've witnessed in the people that we've been able to help is that it's able to reach its full completion. Like what I've, what I was experiencing is, is when we, I was in my grieving process and just cause our culture doesn't have a lot of understanding or room on how to grieve is people want to help and in helping they're trying to explain it they're trying to make it feel better 
And to me, that actually was stopping the actual process from happening. And it was dismissing whatever raw emotions and feelings that I was having. Um, and so the work that we do is inviting people to go into the messy, go into this doesn't make any sense because there is, it's not linear. It's not a start a go step through step, you know, one through five. Right. It's, it's embracing the um, what in this moment is it that I need and how do I create really healthy boundaries and saying no um, where it's not supporting my own process right now. Hmm. Yeah, grieving can be can be so open ended. I know from my own experience, it's just there's it's not a linear process. It doesn't follow logic, and it's it, it is funny. It's like what you know, our world, our consumer society doesn't necessarily, you know, embrace grief. It's like it's it's not part of the consumer process. So what do you, what do you do with grieving? It's like it's you know, it is difficult. And and for me, I just want to say that I've been in recovery from mental illness and addiction for almost two decades. And I've done a lot of work to, to maintain that recovery. And um, when we lost our son, I found that I had to find a whole new level of support um, and tools on top of what I had learned for, for the uh, mental illness and addiction recovery. But for the grief, it was like a whole nother set of things that did not make any sense. Um, though I had been recovering from other things that have similarities as far as the experience may be concerned. Grief just kind of did its own thing and had its way with me. And I think it's kind of like that a little bit for everyone. I think it's a very personal process. It's also very difficult. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, so, so what is, what is the community aspect of, of Live Like Goose in terms of partnerships and, and, and bringing it out to the, the larger community? Yeah. So a lot of the community work is like, we actually have community groups that meet here um, and the other aspect, the larger outreach community is collaborating with uh, different schools as well as we are partnered right now with um, Richmond PAL, uh, the Police Activities League, and they work with a lot of, of the youth, the youth mm -hmm. in the community. And so what it helps to really embrace is that community aspect. So instead of this concept where you're grieving, you hide away and you go into a cave and go do it by yourself or even in the trauma work, it's actually helping because we heal. We honestly, we heal in community. We heal in relationship with others. Mm -hmm. And so really bringing that so you don't have to be ashamed or hide away what you're going through, that you can be part of the group and still go through it and you're welcomed is so potent. Um, some of the youth that we were talking to up in, in Richmond, there is just such a gratitude that we can talk about everyone's own individual experiences and still be a part of this group container that they don't have to run away. They don't have to hide it. They don't have to mask it. That it was actually welcomed mm -hmm. and exactly where they're at. And so having that both and process of like, I am feeling like crap right now and don't want to be here and I am okay. And I'm still part of this is such a potent mixture into this group that we, we bring in. It's, it's yeah. Right. These, these kids mm -hmm. were in a, an experimental diversion program. Uh, they were high schoolers who had gotten in trouble and this program was trying to give them a holistic approach in a community approach as an, ex, as an opportunity to change their course in their life and their past. And these were amazing kids. And mm -hmm. I think what she was speaking to, which was amazing about it was we were able to sit down adults and, uh, you know, teenagers and have this really comfortable and amazing open uh, conversation. And these youth that had been uh, held back or, uh, you know, um, isolated or, you know, unable to connect with others were, were really opening up and they were participating in some really, really cool conversations that were very mm -hmm. open and honest and healing. Yeah. Yeah. Tavis, you may have mentioned one of them, if, if, I, if I'm thinking of the same, but it might have been one with the uh, community group and the DA and the police. Is, is this yeah. one? Yeah. What, what, what was that? yeah. That sounds pretty powerful. What was that all about? As Monica had mentioned, it's uh, Richmond Pals um, Activity League. So Richmond Police Department has an activity league that's been very active for some time and has gotten mm -hmm. a lot of support. And uh, they have a boxing program. Program and uh, Monica boxes, and she oh. was introduced to their uh, program, 
um, and was wanting to do boxing uh, for youth as uh, you know a grief and trauma recovery tool, as she had mentioned earlier. And it just so happened that they had this diversion plan and they needed grief and trauma recovery support. Um, so uh, it was a right place, right time. And uh, they, they asked us to come in and we were happy to do so. And now we're being integrated into their uh, program. Mm. Great. And one of, one of the things that I admire and respect so much about this program that they have been working on and putting together is that, it, like you mentioned, is that they're representatives from the DA's office who worked with the, um, the, the victims and the victims' families. And they're also law enforcement that were there as well. Mm -hmm. And that the kids, um, the youth that was there, that everybody was there to really support the, the teenagers and giving them education as opposed to being talked at. Like yeah. we, were, we were literally sitting at the table mm -hmm. together. Like mm -hmm. the, the adults were intermingled with the, the youth that were there and we were just having a conversation. And it was the education that because they come from so many different backgrounds and so many different experiences that may, they may have never had before. And especially when it comes into the context of grief and trauma, there's so much acting out that happens mm -hmm. because of the actual underlying core pieces. Mm -hmm. And so really being able to teach them and understand that their actions and their words is a mistake or a choice and it's not who they are because that starts that whole cycle, right? I am a bad person, this is all I can do. And so a lot of this program was amazing about how do you really disrupt this pattern and the cycle from happening and really give the, the youth the resources that they, have, they haven't had yet. Um, and it's just, uh, it's amazing. I'm really in awe of what they're, they're doing up there. Hmm. It's so neat. I, I wonder if you can give some other examples of, of things you do, is it certain, activities out in the community it would be a class setting would it be an activity like a sports thing or what what might be another thing that you would do a as part of this so another uh, another program that we're doing is um at my old high school where my my son and my siblings went and um we're providing a alternative a restorative justice alternative to detention standard detention is punitive you do your time and you go go on your way and so what I've done is some, some training with Mindful Schools, which is a great program. I definitely suggest checking it out if you're a teacher especially. Mm -hmm. And I'm bringing basically mindfulness into detention to, hope, to help these students who are acting out become more present with themselves and identifying their emotions so that they can make different choices when, when they want to act out. Instead of reacting, they can slow down and learn how to choose to do something differently, uh, which is life changing. Mm -hmm. And I know that because I used to get in trouble and be in detention and had to learn this all for myself. Right. And I think it's hard right. for a kid or, or, or any, any adult. I mean, I wish I had learned it earlier. Yeah, seriously. It's so, it's so good to have a support structure for something like grieving mm -hmm. and, and dealing with difficult and you know, processing with you know, difficult emotions. It's like, wow, it's a. I think it probably helps keep a lot of kids out of trouble, to be sure. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, you know, if you look ahead, you know, what are your goals to you think about, you know, one year out, three years out, five years out? What would you, what would you like to do, you know, coming up? Mm -hmm. Change the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> much, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one step at a time, right? <laughs> right. Um, the big, the big vision of, of expanding and growing into is really, the heart of it is, is larger systemic change. And um, there's two areas that we are already implementing and into is the high schools and the schools, as well as the juvenile justice system. Um, and the other vision potential that's kind of when it's ready is looking at the foster care system as well. Mm -hmm. And so when I say systemic change and looking even at the education is that um, one of the pilot programs that we are embarking on is actually teaching teachers how to teach differently. Uh huh. Yeah, California has rolled out a newer piece of legislation where the educators and the schools need to be trauma informed and they're, they're trained. And to me, we're taking it to a whole different level is not just educating the teachers on how it affects the student, um, but actually how do we teach differently? How do we create the classroom differently? How do we really um, 
address like all the needs of the students. So the content in a way becomes secondary, but it becomes so much easier to learn because you're teaching from a different place. And so like the vision is of starting to, to really do systemic change in the educational system and the juvenile justice systems. You start small and you intentionally start small because you keep the integrity of the change and the change to make it bigger and bigger. And so the vision of being able to be the ripples in the Bay Area of making that change is a huge core heart of, of the work that we do. Mm. What, what might be, I, I know there's probably too big a topic to really explain, but how would, how would a teacher teach differently, or approach the classroom differently with that, with, with what you're talking about in mind? What, what would, might possibly change? Yeah, so I used to be a former educator. Uh, I was a high school teacher. And so as far as teaching, um, the, the difference in, in teaching it, like you actually shift the culture of the, the dynamics of the classroom a lot and you change your pacing a lot. And instead of creating the lesson plan where you're trying to figure out all the details of what you're trying to teach, you actually create a whole different rhythm and pacing. Um, and the reason why it's so important to shift that is because students who are in in trauma response or in grief or they're just in high anxiety what happens is their cognitive functions shut down and they can't even think or they can't even process and so they're getting more and more information that's thrown at them that they can't understand and so they're feeling even more like a failure and so it just starts to compound and so mm -hmm. if you actually disrupt that and you learn how to change how you're teaching. There's honestly, there's been research done where there's people learn in nine different ways. Right. However, so much of the educational system is you sit in this, you sit in your desk and it's either you, you listen. So it's words, you either hear it or you see it or it's in words, but actually trying to move that into more movement. Um, do it in expressive ways that you actually start to take the information that you can process it differently. It actually mm -hmm. totally changes how you are in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, uh, the other big piece is it's embodied educa education. There it is. Um, what, what do you mean by that in embodying that education? So embodied education, if we can experiment a little bit, is that okay? Sure. No, let's, let's experiment. Right on. Okay. So if you just take a couple breaths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then slowly allow yourself to kind of right now I can feel you right in your throat drop down a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit more. It, it, it does. It does change. It actually changes the way the body feels. The body does sort of drop down lower into the abdomen. It's, like it's not up here as much. It's a little lower down. Exactly. And yeah. so I'm going to continue speaking as you stay in that place. Mm -hmm. And so when I teach and I'm talking from there, it's orienting from a different place. Right. And if we're in our mind, our mind's trying to figure it out and put all the, the puzzle pieces in the right places. Whereas if we slow down, like our, our physiology, our body actually slows down. Right. So our nervous system can actually like take in information at a different pace yeah. as well as we're understanding in a different way. So we're not trying to figure it out. We're just letting everything kind of come in and, and absorbing the, the pieces and allowing a natural processing to happen. And so noticing how that shifts it, it's um, the experiment is for me to teach the teachers how to start to bring that process into the classroom. So, yeah, what it is, I mean, in a nutshell, is is teaching teachers how to be more present with themselves, and in so doing that, be more present with the students. And when there's that awareness, there's a opportunity for connection, a deeper connection in the classroom. And in that deeper connection is where more more communication occurs, and ultimately where healing occurs as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, it's sort of in, in the exercise, it, it puts you in a position where you can really feel your feelings. And when you can feel your feelings, you can begin to move them forward. I think it's when we are, when we are divorced from our feelings, it's harder to process them and harder. We get stuck with them. Right. Absolutely. 
Yeah. yeah. It actually puts us in conflict with it because we're trying to suppress our, our emotions that we're not aware of and then still function at the same time. Right. However, if we're learning just to be aware of it without changing it or fixing it or doing anything to two of them, mm -hmm. then they can just be with us. It's like one of the metaphors that I use is like, like there's room in the sandbox for all the pieces. Like we don't have to like choose one or the other, like, Oh, well, let's make the sandbox even bigger. Right. And, and I can, I can feel anxiety and I can be present to what the teacher's teaching as opposed to creating this tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if I, we get back to the future piece a little bit, I, I'm wondering if, if, if you were to, if, if live like goose was to receive additional funding, what, what, what would that allow you to do? in going forward in terms of your programs and, and working with uh, trauma and grief recovery. So, yeah. so right now we're in that stage of just working with people that need help. There's a lot of people that need what it is we're offering, whatever that may be, we're doing it to suit these different programs. So whatever they need, we're showing up in that way. But in the future, there's been talk about having um, a wellness center or a, a truly holistic wellness center where people could mm -hmm. come and get every aspect of themselves. Um, they can work on themselves in every different way and have more truly holistic healing, you know, and work through this process. Cause there's a lot of people out there that are doing great work and they work on an aspect of an individual. And then they need other mentors or teachers or uh, facilitators to, to, to work with different other aspects of them. So there's a lot of this referring people around to get different types of treatments for whatever they may be. We want to bring that all in house into a place where someone can walk in and receive all those different options without having to get to know people and get referrals and all that kind of thing. Neat. Okay. So it would, it would, it would really make it a more, it would be a faster process, a, an easier process, more efficient process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Real. yeah. 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 It's like one person comes in and we work as a tribe and a whole community to really work them together. And, and we, we work off of each other's strengths, right? Nobody has to have them all. And so somebody can really get like all the resources and the support that they really need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff. I mean, I, is there anything you'd like to say in closing just about, about the, you know, your, your work or what you'd like to do or, or what you have done or what, what, what matters to you right at, at this moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we're doing is uh, we're trying to uh, show up and be present and engage. We're trying to do that individually within ourselves, um, also in relationship and also in uh, partnership and live like goose. So our whole thing is an inside out process. So we're trying to practice what it is we're trying to teach on, our, on every day at, at all times. Mm -hmm. And so we bring that into the larger scope and, the, and, those pick, and, and larger groups and whatnot. So we've got to practice what we teach. And then part of it is when we're practicing what we're teaching, we're also showing how how it is to do what it is we're doing when it comes to mindfulness and, and presence and emotional intelligence and these kinds of things. So it's been a very, very organic process and it's been happening in a way that's just magical. It's like, here's energy, here's opportunity. We haven't had to plan too much. We haven't had to do all the normal business things. We've just really been present, showed up and engaged. And we're finding ourselves um, on this journey, on this path that we're being pulled to do these things naturally mm -hmm. and it's it's a wonderful inside out process that we're sharing with the world yeah yeah my the biggest concept in the word that kept coming up to close with is is it's about connection mm. it's about deep like true connection and being able just to do have a space where people can feel really seen is that that is like first and foremost like the healing process is that I, I usually the people who end up coming through our doors are like there's no other place that they feel they could share what they share and it's because we just connect there's no fixing no judging and and unfortunately in our world which is going faster and faster and faster right. and and sometimes a little bit skimming on the superficial for right. those of us who like to kind of like our connection is really in the depths of the waters and giving them a home where they can land is really what we're teaching the, the youth and the communities out there of reminding us who we are and how to connect again. 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's like there are, we're conditioned so much to be outside of ourselves. And so remembering how we connect with ourselves first. And then from that place, there's others around us that, that are there to like, to meet us in that, in that depth place again. Mm. Yeah. That's great. It's, 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 I, I really wish the two of you, you know, the best of luck. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic project, fantastic organization. So I, it's great. Thanks for sharing that with us today. And then thank you very much. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank we you really, so much. Really appreciate that. We really, I really appreciate <laughs> working with you. And thank you for being so patient. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um.